We're really excited to be taking part in something to talk about on a monthly basis with this BEMA hosted discussion, which we're calling Show and Tell, in which a guest will come and speak about the art that inspires them and what they do before opening up to your questions and a larger group discussion. So today I'm joined by Kristen Tollefson. Take it away. Hi, I'm Kristen Tollefson. I'm the Director of Education and Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Advancement at the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art. And um, I'm really delighted that Annika and the Senior Center invited me to join today. Um, this is a great, this is actually a great excuse and opportunity for me to share something that has been a part of my life for a long time. I, when Annika and I were talking about this program and, um, you know, of course we would like to pe have people looping into the work that's on display at the art museum, but we also recognize that art, what we really want is for people to connect with art on, you know, at every point in their lives or find things that are um, visually stimulating and want to talk about them. So um, this is a good opportunity for me to share a little bit about, both about myself and about uh, a work of art. So I'm going to make an attempt here to share again. I am going to talk about the artist Kata Kolvitz. Um, the, interesting thing in my mind about Kate Kolvitz really was that she, you know, we, I started learning about her when I was quite young. Um, I was probably 19 years old when I first came across Kate's work. And um, here's a slide showing some comments that were given to me after I first presented my research about her work. I, I was an art history major in college and um, probably a really early, I, well before college, I was a contrarian. And so when, I, when it came to the time to select the artists that I wanted to delve into for my senior comprehensive writing project and presentation, I, I didn't want to just go with a a well-known painter or somebody I had learned about in when I did my study abroad in Italy. I, I was really interested in this idea of art and social justice very early on. Um, so here's me right around the time that I was getting my first um, exposure to Kate of, Kate's work. That one, now you're seeing it? We're not seeing you, we're seeing... You're seeing a, it's the Peasant Uprising? Yeah, that's that sounds like a good title. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Kate's work struck me for obvious reasons. This is, uh, this is one of her most famous works um, that really sums up the quality of um, both her skill as the printmaker and the the content, the the topic that she was really delving into. Um, many people recognize her work in the context of peasant wars, social uprising, workers, and um, mothers as well. Um, Let's see, here we go. A lot of her work was very moving, very visceral. And, um, you know, it's hard to turn away from images like this one, a mother holding her deceased child. Um, I, you know, I, I did study abroad in Florence during my junior year and, you become accustomed to a certain level of um, kind of narrative, um, telling a story, a lot of biblical stories, a lot of the work was um, kind of instructive. And I came, when I came back to campus and started 
learning about um, Kolwitz's work, I was struck by this kind of the level of humanity that she was letting um, people see in her work. It was really uh, impossible for me to not get sucked in. Even, even work like this that was very um, stable and um, a little bit more flat still had that quality of emotion. A, a very, I had a really visceral reaction to the way that um, the hands especially are rendered and the arms grasping, you know, um, encircling these two children. But what you see running through her body of work is a series of self-portraits. Um, she did self-portraits at many different stages of her life. And um, we'll go to the next slide. And also had a number of self of portraits taken of her, um, so you can see that her rendering the um, the way that she depicted herself was strikingly accurate, but also really unforgiving. Um, she did not try to elevate or glorify or smooth over and the energy and you can see this in particular in this work in the background the energy of the strokes on the arm um, there's just a very uh, visible tactile connection between what i was seeing and what i learned about her which was that she was uh, she was an incredibly strong and um, early dedicated to her artwork person she was encouraged by her father to pursue her artwork she, although she met her husband when she was quite young and married quite young, um, she pursued her work throughout her life and wove her personal story into her artwork as well. Um, so we're going to go to the next slide. So this is the piece that I want to talk about a little bit today. And um, I just want to tell you the story behind it, which is that um, in all this research that I was doing on Kate Kolwitz, I was a student in Minnesota at Carleton College in the mid-late 80s, and the things that were accessible to me in learning about her were really getting copies of articles through interlibrary loan or copies of books, and there were not very many at that time written about this artist who kind of fell outside of mainstream art history. She, she was definitely recognized as a technical, you know, as a technical wonder in printmaking, especially lithography, which is a printmaking on stone, using stone as the plate and her etchings. Um, but even in the mid late eighties, the art historical canon was centered on painting and sculpture and um, sometimes architecture, but not really even photography or printmaking. A lot of um, that was considered kind of potentially outside or cutting edge um, when you looked back at the, at the long history of art. So her work had not been recognized to the degree that it is now. And I think there are a number of other women artists who've seen later exposure and um, really kind of come out from behind the, the male dominated field, especially I'm talking about Western art, art history right now. Um, so I really hadn't, I had never seen her work in person, but you know, you look at this reproduction on the screen and again, like I say, the the energy that she put into rendering her face and the hand and the variation of line and the really absolute embrace of dark and light. She was unafraid to make a shadow, unafraid to make a, a jagged line. It was really evident even in the copies of work that I was looking at. And it wasn't until, um, I'm gonna say 2015, uh, maybe 2015, 
when I saw her work in person at Davidson Galleries in Seattle. And um, for those of you who don't know, Davidson Galleries has, uh, they show a lot of different work, but they do specialize in print, um, prints, different kinds of prints. So um, I saw her work and I had absolutely, I was absolutely overcome with emotion seeing it in person for the first time. It's, you can see the incisions that have been transferred from the printing uh, plate to the paper and the way the ink is almost um, pressed into or suspended on the paper. It's, um, it's just really beyond description what I saw. It was like the, another layer of this interaction with the artist. And um, there's, a, it's, there's a name for that happening when you have an emotional reaction, um, you're overcome by emotion. It's called Stendhal syndrome. And it was named after a, um, a Swedish, I think he was a, a, going on the grand tour, a, a Swedish man who uh, went into a fit basically when he um, got to Florence and saw the amazing work that was just all immersing him. He was immersed in. So um, I had a little touch of the Stendhal syndrome there in the gallery. And um, my partner at the time made note of that. And so flash forward six months later, um, we were in the car together and he presented me with a paper wrapped gift and inside was a copy of this print. And so um, years later, after having this really intimate relationship with an artist over the course of time and um, having this really intimate exchange with the work in person, I was the became the proud owner of one of her works. So I'm going to go ahead and stop presenting so I can show you the work here. And um, so I've, I brought it today. This is, this is what it looks like. And um, it resides in my bedroom right next to my bed. I see it twice a day getting up and getting into bed. And um, it's just become a real integrated part of my life. And uh, my, the story has grown around it. Um, I, I'll tell you another piece of the story that um, is interesting too. I, you can see that the, the work is a square format and it's pretty small. It's um, less than 12 inches square. Um, when this work was actually created as a print, the print paper was probably uh, 24 inches long and quite a bit wider, maybe 18 inches wide. And um, when my partner took it to the, my partner at the time, uh, took it to have it framed, he, t he was telling me that he, uh, the framer was really indignant about, um, you know, like not cutting it down. And in fact, it is a small uh, crime to cut down an original print like this. So what I have is a very, it's like doubly personal because um, if I were to try to sell this on the resale market, which of course I would never do, but um, it's, it's lost some value because it's been the paper, the original paper has been cut. So in a way it's like a second impression uh, the print itself, the the image, the print itself, maybe a third impression that um, there's been this interaction uh, beyond the original artist. So that is the work that uh, that I wanted to share today, and um, I'm happy to to talk more about Kate Kolvitz's work or what. Um, it was so interesting. I I'll just say I. I don't really consider myself a hoarder, but I did come across as I was preparing for today, um, all of my notes from my, my thesis. 
just for the record, I'm 53 years old now. So that would have been uh, 30, almost 35 years old that uh, this stuff is. So I, I, I have all my notes that I took for this project, including notes from the peer review that I was subjected to when I presented my thesis. And it's fascinating to look back at this and think about a piece of work that sticks with you through such a huge portion. I mean, that's more than half my life. Uh, think about the relationship that I have with the work, but also what was really lovely is to see how themes in what I was attracted to then have grown and deepened and matured over the years. And that if I, if I caught a glimpse through the lens of my personal, you know, my knowing of myself now at myself as a, an 18 year old, 19 year old, I would have seen the, the, the essence of who I would become, even though I didn't know that at the time. So still um, very committed to themes that come at social justice, still very um, much a contrarian, um, just ask my parents, ask my kids actually now. <laughs> uh, and I just read an article that was in the New Yorker a couple, um, I think it was maybe just this last issue, um, Peter Sheldahl, who's been an art critic for the New Yorker for a long time, talks about his visit to the Frick, Frick collect, excuse me, Frick collection, which is uh, not one of the major, um, it's, a, it's a smaller collection. And he talks about how every visit is a biographical exercise that what you notice and what you are not noticing or what, what you're drawn to or what you're kind of turned off by reveals volumes about you as an individual. And um, so that's a way to make a big loop back to FEMA and just to encourage everybody here to, whether you're going into the museum or you're looking at a book or you're having a conversation with somebody about something that you're seeing, those there's always this really rich repository of information in there about where you can learn more about yourself by looking at and talking about, especially with other people, but you can do it on your own too, so. Kristen, um, I, when I was looking at her drawings, I, one thing that just really struck me was the maternal protection. Mm -hmm. I mean that, uh, you know, if anybody's here as a mother, and I think maybe a few of us are, is that, the, there, that she described that so well. I mean, especially in times of turmoil. And I, I think of, you know, with this virus going around, how parents are protecting their children and how we, and, and you were talking about the hands about, you know, clasping our children and, and keeping them close to us and protecting them. That was such a powerful statement. Mm. Just thank you so much for sharing her, her works. It was just really quite stunning. Well, and the, one of the things that's interesting about her work is that she was making those images um, as an as a young mother, but before that also. So she had this um, there was a connection that she was making. And then as she experienced huge loss, she lost one of her sons in um, 1914 in the war. And um, so, it was, she was both funneling uh, zeitgeist from that time into her work, but also speaking very personally. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I also think that even if you're not a mother, you still, there's that feeling of fierceness and that kind of um, embrace that it's hard not to, it's hard not to feel that or to to have that resonate somehow. I think we've all felt that kind of um, strong connection to a person in our lives or people. The museum has a really lovely, uh, very comprehensive um, biographical write-up about her. Her work is, 
in so many collections. I mean, a copy of this print is at the Museum of Modern Art and at the Met. Um, there were, I think I read somewhere that there were about a thousand impressions taken of the print. And because the plate wasn't destroyed, I think that it was probably printed again. So um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, her work is very accessible in, in many ways. And I think that's the, that's also the magic of print. It's, there's, there are replicas of it. So it can be out in the world and people can actually see it in person. I'd love to say you could come over to my house <laughs> and see, see more of her work. Um, but it is really, it's, there's a lot, there have been shows of her work now. There's a lot more um, scholarship that's been done writing about her. Um, she was unique in many ways. I mentioned that her dad had been very encouraging of her as an artist, and she was she had she was recognized as having technical talent very early on, and she continued to make that a focal point in her life even after um, writing in her journal that she had some second thoughts about getting married so young, she wondered if she had done the right thing. So, um, so many levels that we can identify with there. <laughs> oh, well, that was <laughs> extremely moving and, and um, just kind of reached inside to, to see the, the print and and the real piece and but to hear your story too was so touching when you went to college were you um were you focused on art were you focused on um art history or i mean did you have that feeling as you were you, when you were this young person um that's a great question and it actually is a really uh I will try not to become overly emotional about that. That's a, it's a great question. I was also identified early, I, I identified early as an artist, as a maker. And um, my mom had gotten married when she was young, before she graduated from college. And so dropped out of college after she married my dad and went back to school to finish her Bachelor of Fine Arts in Painting when I was in fifth grade, when we first moved to Bainbridge. We were living in a trailer in our driveway. And um, so I got to go to class with my mom at the yeah. UW. And I was young and I got to sit in on a figure drawing class with a nude model when I was probably 10 years old. And I felt so um, mature and, you know, like, just a really, I, I, it was a pretty big piece of, you know, big impression that that was, that made on me. So when I went to college, I really struggled with, and it, this is something that I continue to struggle with. It does touch on the social, social justice piece, doing something that was helpful for people. And so I actually, I didn't major in art in college. I majored in art history and anthropology, and I couldn't I couldn't extricate one from the other. They felt really tied together to me, and that's actually that combination of things has continued both in my art practice, and I continue to be a practicing artist, and in the way that I've ended up in museum education. So. Um, it's a real, I will say that it continues to be really rich and a real internal struggle because I, I know that art is, I mean, I know firsthand how art can elevate and have a profound impact on people and them thinking outside themselves being kind of a salvation, but it's not feeding somebody, you mm -hmm. know, making sure that they're fed or clothed. So, um, I did have those feelings and they've been kind of in tussling with each other for my entire life. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. Well, it, um, it really comes through. I, I mean, the, the marriage of these poles uh, really comes through um, the great strength that you seems 
as I'm observing this is that here you are able to, you're still continuing with your artwork, but you're, you're doing these social, you have this um, platform, which you might not have had if you were just went one way, but you've had this platform that's reaching others in a big way. So it's, it's very touching. Hmm. Very. Thank you, Thank you Bonnie. <laughs> I'm kind of crying to myself. I mean, you know what I mean? It's just that it really had a punch. So, oh, thank you. You have a very softness about you, but this was very strong. Oh, yeah. thank you. It's beautiful. I also want to say that I know a future guest will be Alison Kettering, who, um, in a big circle connection, uh, was my art history professor in college and she has retired to Bainbridge Island. Wow. And she will be talking about, I don't want to blow her cover, but she'll yeah. be talking about <laughs> Fred Hagstrom's work. And Fred was a professor with Allison and also one of my professors and has a very lovely book that is in the collection at BIMA that talks about the Japanese exclusion story through the lens of a student who went to Carleton um, during the war and whose family, who's from Seattle. And so, um, yeah, oh, it's, yeah. again, very meaningful. Yes. Oh, be wonderful. Yeah. But that will be in April is when Allison will be guesting. Yeah. Which yeah. I, I think it will just, it will be wonderful. And also, um, yeah, she's just, so knowledgeable about his work on a personal and a more like art historic level and it will be a really nice introduction to all the wonderful book art that we have at BIMA which just I'm constantly surprised by how um how rich our our collection of book art is specifically well and I want to say thanks to Annika for making this happen um I know Annika introduced themselves already, but uh, I can't say enough about having their help this year. We are um, just, it, we just really hit the jackpot. So thanks, Annika. Well, I'm, I'm very, very happy to be here. And I'm so happy that um, we finally were able to, to bring a little uh, Bima to the something to talk about. <laughs>